distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, we'll now start the plenary session to Part B, Effective Public Institutions and Digital Government for Advancing the SDGs. This, this plenary session will be further discussion on effective public institutions and digital government for advancing the SDGs with a focus on the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on public governance. Now, it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished moderator, Ambassador Taishik Jo, for this plenary session. Ambassador Jo is the Secretary General of the Korea NGO Council for Overseas Development Cooperation, KCOC. Prior to joining the civil, so civil society, he was a career diplomat. He was Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to Canada and Deputy Minister for Planning and Coordination of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Korea. Please welcome Ambassador Jo with a big round of applause. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, this morning I just heard the, uh, the uh, city of Incheon has three million uh, citizens. And uh, the organization I represent, KCOC, is also a membership of three million. Three million citizens who are making contributions for their donation to, to enhance the uh, development cooperation. So on behalf of the uh, three million volunteers and members of the KCOC, I would like to welcome all of you to this symposium and to Korea and to Incheon City. Um, the uh, aims of this, this session, plenary session, is to address one of the most challenging topics, I think it's one of the mo most uh, challenging topics in, in, in these days, uh, which is the fourth industrial revolution. I think this, is, uh, this phrase gives me a, uh, a sense of a mixture of hope and fear, sometimes a mixture of aspiration and uh, frustration. A, in this session, so we will focus on this important issue. The, uh, we would like to uh, address the, the challenges and opportunities for especially public institutions with the rise of this fourth industrial revolution. Uh, three years, I think three years have passed since the adoption of the agenda uh, for uh, sustainable development. And the new wave of revolution, I think it will have a great impact on the implementation of this agenda of sustainable development. And this, uh, the fourth industrial revolution characterized by this new and uh, very uh, dramatic technological uh, change has the potential to, to make our service delivery more inclusive, to leave no one behind. But it has also, at the same time, it is posing a serious challenges and risk, including the loss of jobs and cybersecurity issues. I suppose at present only few countries, a few countries are ready, are preparing to embrace this new wave of revolution. And uh, many and most of the developing countries, I believe, is uh, really concerned that this amazing, the speed of the change, speed of this uh, evolution. So I hope that this session will provide 
a, a meaningful opportunity to gain some insight and to gain some as the uh, uh, inspiration from I mean, to cope with these uh, challenges we are facing. Uh, before I give the floor to this, uh, my first speaker, let me uh, highlight uh, the, uh, the time management a little bit. I believe you have the uh, brochure, the outlet, I mean the, uh, the, 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 the booklet for the agenda item. On, your, on page 20, I think you, ha you may have your agenda item. And we have about two hours, uh, uh, around two hours. And my suggestion is to divide those two hours into two. One, the first part, we will have a presentation. And the second part, the second half of this uh, session, one hour, we would like to have interactive uh, discussion. So this first part, we will have uh, seven speakers uh, and um, uh, seven or eight minutes each. And we have uh, four topics, but we have seven speakers. The reason uh, may be a little confusing, but if you look at this uh, agenda item, you can find the, uh, the first topic, we have four speakers. And the rest of three topics, we have just one speaker. So, during this presentation session, I would like to uh, minimize the Q&A session. So I'm going to take one or two questions in between of this presentation. And then, because we have uh, plenty of opportunities that we can raise these uh, questions and comments in this second half of the, uh, the interactive session, discussion session. Um, so the, uh, the first uh, part of the first topic of this plenary session, we'll start for presentation. It's on the impact of forced industrial revolution on public governance. Um, the, uh, we have, uh, out of four speakers, we have uh, three uh, speakers are here, and one of these speakers will be, uh, he's in Muscat, uh, Oman right now, so he will be, we will connect him with uh, Sky, Skype. So now let me uh, invite our first uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Kang Dong Sok, Vice President, National Information Society Agency, Korea. Uh, you have the floor, Mr. Kang. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dong Seok Kang, Vice President of National Information Society, a statutory agency for establishing e-government policy and managing related projects. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks to UN POG at UN DESA uh, for inviting me uh, to this meaningful event. Uh, it might only take a bit of time to cover all issues involved. However, I would like to introduce the blueprint of future Korean e-government and services. Uh, I am sure <clears throat> many of you uh, have heard of this match of this century. Ancient board game, uh, Badu, uh, Grandmaster Sedo Lee, uh, versus Google DeepMind AlphaGo two years ago in 2016. Uh, since then, uh, AI technology drew attention in Korea and Korean government responded to it, selecting AI as the core technology agenda of e-government. Hence, uh, Korean government since the last year uh, has been trying to find how to apply cutting-edge technologies like AI in our government business culture as well as the services the government provides to the people. Uh, as you can see, Korean government has achieved uh, very much so far, but we still have many limitations. And this was a starting point for making AI policy. 
we are fully aware that uh, government services uh, have heavily focused on digitalization of the existing process only and had been provided on web-based in most cases. Yeah, the digital divide is increasing. Uh, therefore, Korean government made a decision to carry out digital transformation in order to respond to these challenges. The digital transformations uh, has come already in general industry and brought business transformation. Uh, new technology like AI, big data, uh, cloud, etc., has made old processes uh, intelligent. Uh, governmental transformation will redefine and rebuild uh, every work process, service, organization, culture, and digital perspectives. We will strengthen open government, data-driven government, and go forward to open our one government to provide seamless services, regardless of time, location, department, and kinds of work. Now, we call it uh, intelligent government. Uh, this intelligent government has the value orientation and the final goal. The horizontal ethics is citizen government relationship, uh, showing participation level of the citizen. As the intelligent government is advanced, citizen empowerment will be encouraged. The vertical is the provided uh, service level. With the development of intelligent government, the level is changing from uh, digitization of administrative affairs to customize the services over service integration. Eventually, uh, intelligent government is creating uh, sustainable social value beyond transparency, accountability, and economics. I believe the ultimate or, uh, value of the intelligent government is in line with that of UN Sustainable Development Goals. In order to implement intelligent government, Korean government is planning a number of projects. I would like to introduce two of them today. The first project is called AI Policy Council. AI Policy Council helps civil servants making smart policy decisions with big data analytics and machine learning throughout uh, policy making process. As you see in this slide, AI Council itself will analyze inquiry made from the area A and use the data to predict uh, policy demand of the area B, which has a similar living environment with A. Hopefully, we expect AI Council will provide uh, the solution in the future. Second project I would like to introduce is uh, AI Personal Assistant. AI Personal Assistant will provide uh, personal assistant services anytime and anywhere. Uh, President uh, e-government services are not fully customized enough. However, once AI personal assistant is applied, uh, it will provide fully customized user-specific intelligent services. It will predict uh, possible user demands, uh, inform the user the proper service, and take care of the necessary procedure according to user demands. By now, I have introduced uh, intelligent government and related services. To conclude, uh, there are three issues and challenges we should consider in pursuing intelligent government. First, we need to open more public data and improve its quality. Uh, by opening, public data in high demand and managing them in systematic manner so that intelligent government service 
could be provided evenly. Second, we need uh, private-driven e-government services. We are considering ways uh, where the private sector can initiate, develop government services, and government just accept uh, the services. The necessary implementation plan is on the way accordingly. Uh, finally, we are considering setting up uh, guidelines on e-government legal institutions to respond to intelligent technology changes. So far, uh, I have introduced intelligent government in Korea and where it's going. I do hope uh, this will help you, the purpose and your end as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gang. Now let me invite uh, our second speaker, Mr. Shuliang Wang, Executive Dean, Beijing Institute of Technology, China. You have the floor, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, good, evening, uh, good morning. Thank you for giving me a good uh, practice to speak about my research. My title is The Impact of Artificial Intelligence on Public Governance from Perspective of Big Data. And I will introduce it in three parts. First, first motivation. We live in the world from macro world to the micro world. So the data grows bigger and bigger from KB to YB, and also satellite from outside head and become bad and bigger and bigger. This function channel satellite. And also some examples from Baidu, Taobao, Tengxun, and also to create data become bigger and bigger. So we are drawing a sea of data, how to get the data of our, uh, our growth. And also our intelligence become great and great along with uh, our brain. So when urbanization look happen and the industrialization green, informationalization sustainability and also named as SDG and uh, only a small part of our brain is occupied. So how to organize, uh, organize the information to wire them? AI is an uh, automated way, but how to do? We give some method. Uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping mentioned AI is a good way to increase increment productivity. And also he called for collaboration uh, from the nations on AI topics. And also in uh, 2017, Chinese President Li Qiang and incorporated the term artificial intelligence. And the key features of China's AI strategies for, so main drivers, hardware, data, uses, and algorithm are also commercial AI sector. And also in China's standardization of the administration released a white paper on artificial intelligence in standardization. And also we had the digital China Summit and also to help people to live a better life. And so, Someone, I, I think, uh, smart city equals to digital city and the Internet of Things and cloud computing and big data and also artificial intelligence. And finally, we will do everything on web, see everything, ask everything, and answer everything. The goal is to make the people better and better. And the digital infrastructure from the data uh, uh, layer and to the uh, information public platform and also demo application. And the Internet things will give uh, interoperability between human and human, human and machine, machine and machine. And also cloud computing from the emergencies to the platform and become the fast and faster. 
So from space data, the real world, the space data, space information, and space knowledge, how to do it? OK, some human people will be placed by AI. And also, the result is a super-empowered worker will become. And it's some applications. Uh, AI plus medical care service. Uh, from the basic environment to the security system, we will get the high benefit from it. And so, we may care for the aged people. They are lo lonely, and this, the AI will act as a good helper for him. And also AI plus transportation, and when you go out for transportation, we will enjoy our journey. And also AI plus security, 365 days plus 24 hours, we will live safety. And also AI plus text mining, and it takes to good information for you to grow very good. And AA plus justice, they accurately uh, update every five minutes and carry the data of amount 70,000 and 80,000 kids every day. So we will give people good justice. And AA plus prediction and navigation from sensors and wireless signal and collected below you will use a smartphone and enjoy your life. And also AI plus association rules. Associated rules, you first we may create, like, okay. We will create eight rules, and finally we will generate more rules. Also special association when you go out for journey, and you can find the partnership together. The, the same color is the same company. And also location-based prediction. From the table, the first pie picture is the data and the rule, and then give your prediction. And also AI plus night time, light like mass for urban development. And from 19, uh, 19 and 95 to 19, uh, 2013, you may see one better and road around the countries. And also AI plus public safety, we will enjoy the safe environment. And also smart city operating center is the heart of smart city. And it will govern city running enterprise and public also act as its own room. And AI plus governance. For example, based on Alibaba Cloud, the ET brain, we will enjoy the bad life. And also, our, our results had been started by uh, 7,414 uh, secretary count meeting our research, and also the advertisement TV set. Also, in the future, I think, AI plus big data will become better and better. And also, in the period, we will become better and better life, enjoy the sustainable development goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Wang. Now I'd like to uh, invite our uh, third speaker, Mr. Kerimi. Head of the Information Technology and Electronics Industries, World Economic Forum. Um, we are going to connect with from Skype. Yes. Yes. Is it loud and clear? I can hear you loud and clear, indeed. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, you can begin the presentation now. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. A very good morning to you all, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, and the Secretary General, Vice Mayor, Minister. It's such a great pleasure to address you this morning. I apologize that I cannot be there in person, but I hope that my bandwidth allows you to hear and see me clearly. And uh, I'm always available just a, a phone call or an email away for you to follow up with any information, but I very much 
refer to our instructions this very morning. Uh, I only have eight minutes, so I'd rather actually err aside the uh, presentation to leave more time to discuss. But again, I would like to thank the UN colleagues, both in Korea as well as the uh, New York, who organized this extremely important event, which really gets the very heart of what we are trying to do at the World Economic Forum. Uh, my name is Daniel Kirimi, and I've been with the forum for about 10 years um, in various roles. And my current behavior is with the network, global, global network of centers for the that revolution. It's the most uh, innovative project that started about two years ago. We're rapidly expanding because we believe that we have to have a global conversation as well as a very local solution. Now, we stand on the brink of a technological revolution that will fundamentally alter the way we work and relate to one another as citizens, consumers, uh, just human beings. This unprecedented in scaling is open to complexity. This transformation is, is fundamental, it affects every life, it affects industry, government, society. But what is it? What is actually the fourth industrial revolution? You will see a few slides, and again, I, I, when I submitted it, it was more for the visual than for anything else. But if you think about it, the first industrial revolution was all about mechanization. It was about utilizing the power of steam to mechanize some of our processes, to, to make us run faster, to make us produce more. The second industrial revolution was about utilizing the power of electricity to create mass production. So the, the second revolution was about electricity. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Perfect. The third industrial revolution was about use of electronics and information technology to automate production. It was about informatization. And that was happening already since the mid last century. Now, the fourth industrial revolution is building on all of that, and it would not be possible without the previous three, but it's really characterized by the fusion of technologies. There's increasingly blurring the lines between physical, digital, and biologic work, all coming together. Now, there are a few attributes of the third of fourth industrial revolution three attributes of the fourth industrial revolution that make it particularly challenging for everyone, but for governments especially. And it's the velocity, the scope, the system's impact. The velocity of change is just so much more unprecedented than the app. The scope of this change is also tremendous. And the systemic impact, that what makes it tremendously interesting and important for us to address this morning. Now, you are we come from one of our stakeholder groups, government, public sector. The World Economic Forum brings together also private sector, academia, uh, many, many uh, leaders from all walks of life. What's interesting, I think, is that I, I was just reading the Wired magazine, the latest edition, and Lisa Rosetta, who was founding editor and uh, editor of chief in the Wired magazine back in the 90s, October edition said that. Good breakthroughs in the human condition happen outside of politics. History is a record of political failure and a progress to the mark of science and technology. Now, we all know that this is probably not exactly correct. The truth is much more complex than that. But it's really without any doubt that any transformation in the human capacity to produce and consume has led to tremendous uh, changes from political, social, economic, and various other aspects that haven't always been positive. Uh, it's it's it, it, the challenge is greater with every opportunity for us to create better things, and the solutions are some, sometimes not easy to come by with. You, as policymakers, really have to to take a broader view, societal view, if you will and try to minimize the risk that technology brings and maximize the impact of it. You have, to be, you have to be inclusive, you have to be deliberate. Now, how do you do that when the technology is changing so fast, but time 
we can we can come up with the solutions to address the problem. It seems like we're always chasing the last year of problems. Now the good news is that the, the public sector is dealing with that past. If you think about it, uh, in late 1800s in the UK, uh, the Parliament passed a series of, of laws which order later on as alternative to address the very rapidly developing technology of those days, self-driving cars, if you will. And that was, of course, the first cars that were recognized. The steam engines that placed force were to propel self vehicles at the time. Now, the regulators were very uh, excited about the promise of that technology, but also very concerned about its impact on the society and passed the legislation that mandated person to walk in front of each self-guided vehicle with two red flags to signal to everybody, to all the citizens, that there are no horses in front of this vehicle, it's self-moving. Now, obviously, that worked only in a very few years when the vehicle was moving at the pace where a person can walk or run, but within a few years, vehicle developed a capacity that really, really uh, overtook the human capabilities. And the parliament had to completely strike down their own legislation and revisit again what has been done. But the good news is that based on that conversation, they created a system of traffic rules that we're still using today. Instead of thinking in, in, in the old ways about trying to protect citizens by just basically having the person who red flags walking in front of the vehicle, they created a system of traffic rules. They created a system of traffic lights. They created a system of a license plates registration. They created uh, the system of um, uh, of a driving lights for for drivers, and they created everything that we still use today. This is just a very good example to demonstrate that it's very possible to get the solutions to enable industrial revolutions should you try to think in a, in a more creative way in, in, a, in a departing from a previous system of governments and trying to design uh, the new ones. I'm a, and I'm thinking, I'm afraid I'm running a little bit out of time. I'm being, I'm being advised that my time uh, is coming to the end. But I do have a few minutes here. So what I wanted to say is that perhaps the best approach towards the, the policy making regulatory uh, uh, approaches to the fourth industrial revolution, which is happening across many domains that are all interconnected, uh, is perhaps what we call agile government, which is what we define as adaptive, human-centric, inclusive, and sustainable policy maker that acknowledges that policy development is no longer limited to previous processes or previous stakeholders, but need to be more inclusive and need to be more uh, iterative. You try something, you experiment, you move forward without any compromises on the quality, security, and safety of, of, of the citizen. There are a few uh, questions. We like to start always with questions rather than with answers. And because we think that if you spend more time on you can be able to provide better solutions that we uh, look like. And some of the questions that business leaders constantly ask uh, is, what is the context that this thing is happening in? What, how does I maintain my business model or evolve my business model that's kind of under pressure? How do I, as a business leader, strong operational efficiency? How do we how do I innovate differently? How do I maintain good relationship with all the stakeholders? Now, for you as policymakers, the important question obviously is how to manage the transition. How do you maintain and to help protect the citizens? How do you maintain security, privacy, and transit of the commerce development? Do we have the right institutions and tools that will enable this conversation? But at the end of the day, what we need to be thinking is that we need to think about the systems, not specific technologies, because technologies are enablers, but it's about the system. 
We need to be thinking about perhaps empowering people and tech uh, with determining. We need to be thinking by design, not by default. And we need to be putting our values as a feature, not as a bug. Uh, I only have a few seconds left, so I will get to the very end. Um, I will be available to answer any questions or, again, engage in any conversation online or offline. But we very much welcome all of your governments uh, to engage with the global network of centers for the post-industrial revolution. And I'm more than happy to send our UN colleagues uh, know that we work very closely together to organize joint events. We co-design uh, policies, frameworks, and so on. Uh, it's exciting. I know it's not going to be always easy or smooth ride. But again, thinking back, the, we were a always able to put the new system in place where there was a clear need for that. And it's absolutely clear that now there is a need for a new type of thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite our uh, last speaker of the first topic, Ms. Aline uh, Alihanova, head of the sector of the digitalization in industries, uh, Prime Minister's Office, Kazakhstan. Uh, good day, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's symposium with an interesting agenda for the effective exchange of experience of the participating countries. Let me present to your attention a brief report on the development of the digital government and the innovation ecosystem in Kazakhstan. Currently, our country has launched full-scale work on the digitalization of economic sectors within the framework of the state program Digital Kazakhstan, which includes five global areas. These directions are certainly uh, interconnected, and today I will focus on two of them. The transition to a digital state, the creation of innovation ecosystem. The development of a digital government is aimed at uh, transforming the function of uh, the government and providing services to the public and business anticipating their needs. Uh, in Kazakhstan, um, in this direction, constant work is being done to optimize the processes of uh, rendering public services, search for new ways and tools aimed at uh, improving customer focus, developing digital literacy of the population, and also maximizing the transfer of services only to electronic format, digital by default. At present, the Register of Public Services has been formed from uh, 746 of which, uh, six, uh, services, of which uh, 634 electronic services are available electronically through the electronic government portal. Since uh, July uh, 2017, the possibility of obtaining 44 state services are the certificate, certificate of the presence or absence of a criminal records, uh, etc., without using an electronic digital signature, uh, <clears throat> uh, using a one-time password and a login password associated with a cell phone number has been realized. A single contact center provides advice on 707 public services in accordance with the Registry of Public Services. Uh, at the site of the Department Commission for the Selection of Public Services to, the, um, to be provided through the State Corporation, uh, 23 meetings were held this year at which issues of automation and optimization of public services are uh, regularly discussed. From December 2017, the launch of a proactive uh, childbirth service was carried out by receiving SMS uh, confirmation from citizens. Since the beginning of 2018, a service on obtaining electronic certificates uh, by third parties has been available. On the year government web portal, when receiving confirmation from a citizen, such as an address certificate from the place of residence, certificates of the absence of real estate, of registered right to real estate. In order to improve the efficiency of implemented electronic services, reduce paper documents, promote the services of the electronic government portal, and promote digital cultural I mean citizens, the first digital PCC was launched in which citizens can independently receive electronic services in the self-service sector or through public access points, as well as take a course of, uh, in obtaining electronic services. 
As part of the use of uh, advanced digital technologies, it is planned to use the blockchain technology when registered real estate ownership, smart contract, and creating a unified state real estate cadastre. In this area, we expect a significant effect uh, and improvement in the quality of public services by 2022, 25th place in the UN ranking of the Government Development Index, bringing up uh, to 80% of electronic services, increasing the digital illiteracy of the population and eliminating paperwork. Along with this, one of the breakthrough direction of digital Kazakhstan, in our opinion, may be with the consistent development in the innovation ecosystem, taking into account the experience of advanced country. Nowadays, we see uh, trends uh, uh, have changed and how companies from the oil and banking spheres gave way to technology giants. This is the evidence of the fact that technology grows exponentially. We assume uh, that those systems will be gathered into one network, have a real-time connection, self-adjust, and learn new behavioral models. Such networks will be able to build products with the smaller numbers of mistakes to interact with the made goods and adapt to the new needs of consumers if necessary. Considering all this, our president, Nusultan Nazarbayev, in his annual passage, has enchanted the government to create international IT startup hub uh, at one of the facilities of the former Expo 2017. We believe uh, that Astana Hub will become a kind of icebreaker which uh, will be able to pave the um, way for all five directions. The number of uh, attracted investment in Astana Hub startups should reach um, 200 million by 2025, and our super goal is to have at least one of our startups become a unicorn company by 2025. There is an academy with the main purpose of training function. They are already carried out of the school of the trackers, a startup school, school for investors, a school for IT specialists, and a school for programmers. That every time uh, not uh, to involve expensive experts from the abroad, we have decided to carry out our school of, of trackers by Astana Hub forces. The first uh, realized um, they, they have undergone um, 26 people who became partners and trackers of Astana Hub now and help new startups. In our acceleration, there are several models of the development of startups. The first is an educational part where startups for three months attend lectures from the leading trainers or such subjects as pricing, customer development, a search of investor, drawing up valuable offers and others. Well, and of course, all of our infrastructure is available to startups, jobs in a co-working, meeting rooms, cafeterias, the high-speed internet. Here are results of the first program of acceleration. Uh, 151 applications have been received. 14 projects have passed in an accelerator and successfully 10 startups were issued. There are uh, 13 teams in a new team of an accelerated uh, 550 four teams in an incubator. This program now intensively passed in the territory of Astana Hub. We saw some of that day. Uh, what do we give them now? We have an innovation cluster which overgrowing on the territory Expo 2017. It's beginning from Nazarbayev University continues, a big shopping center and inhabited massive. In the neighborhood with Astana Hub will be located IFC, IT University, and offices, IT companies. And this is our list of priority technologies that we support in the first place, big data, um, artificial intelli intelligence, uh, load, robot assistance, cloud computing, neural networks, and others. To support projects, we also plan to create a so investment fund. Also, there is uh, work doing uh, in tax preferences, inclu including a startup visa and others. There are our international and local partners who already conduct their events on the basis of our hub. The, ph the philosophy of Astana Hub is based on several basic principles. In the first place, we have the needs of entrepreneurs and startups. We will do everything in our hands to so that they can work comfortably in our infrastructure. We are working in agile. It means that we uh, work flexibility as much as it possible and we move with the achievement of the small purpose each iteration. And achieve the big purpose, we de uh, divide it for several small. We are open to market as much as it possible. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, just, uh, uh, before we move on to the second topic, I would like to have a brief uh, Q&A session. I would like to have one or two questions from the floor. And I would appreciate it if you could identify your name and organizations. Also, uh, the speakers you would like to raise a question. Now, floor is, yes, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Mustain Villa uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, all presentation uh, is uh, excellent. Uh, I uh, go for the Kazakhstan because it's a very similar history, Kazakhstan and Bangladesh. Uh, we are work uh, digital Bangladesh, Kazakhstan also digital Kazakhstan. Uh, what about the uh, cyber security measures? Uh, would you tell me what's the uh, step have been taken by your government to cyber security? Is there any uh, any step have been taken by the government? Please uh, share with us. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Please. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, yes, we um, Kazakhstan now this is uh, in the high level of ratings of uh, one, and uh, we. <clears throat> try to improve our uh, work to uh, in the sphere of public services because uh, we have a big uh, register of uh, public uh, services for uh, people for our people and we try to uh, maximize optimize and optimize these processes uh, we have a special commission uh, that uh, every week uh, together and um, we decide how to improve these processes and uh, how public services not need or we uh, involve um, other uh, services in this register um, maybe for uh, need for people it's only uh, for um, uh, that uh, services that uh, need people only for that we work. Uh, so if you want uh, more uh, information about this, we can uh, discuss in later. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I would like to have one more questions or comments from the floor. Um, I don't see anyone. So then we can, we would like to move on to the next topic. The, uh, our next speaker will be uh, Mr. Lani Singh, Managing Director of Internet Society. And his topic will be Digital Transformation of Development Challenges. And this session we will discuss on the global uh, digital transformation, focusing on challenges and social inequalities by this new technology. Thank you. You have the floor, sir. Thank you, Ambassador. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Uh, thank you to UNPOG and Keping, of course, for inviting me to be here today. Um, and I guess there's a camera there, so I need to not move around too much, okay? I was in, intending to walk out, uh, walk out over there, but okay. Um, just very briefly on what the Internet Society is, for those who don't know, we are in a global NGO, uh, which, and we were founded by the people who invented the Internet. Uh, we've been around since 1992, and in terms of what we do, uh, we do a lot of work with technical standards, so all the technical standards and protocols that the Internet runs on is part of an organization that we are the organizational home for, the ITF. Apart from that, we do a lot of work in public policy, uh, capacity building, and so on. Uh, effectively, what we want to be doing is to ensure that the Internet keeps growing and evolving, and you know, as I'm sure all of you would agree, that over the last 20 odd years, the Internet has had a profound impact on what we do and how we do things. We have a global presence, as I mentioned, and I'm uh, head of the Asia-Pacific operations based out of Singapore. Now, the internet has, I think, been recognized by many, many people and organizations as a critical enabler of social and economic change. It also offers us uh, some new ways in addressing the development challenges we are facing. However, um, you know, Listening to the previous panelists who spoke, 
uh, there's so much opportunity in all the things that we need to do and that can happen and that will maybe happen in the future. But the issue, of course, is you know, it's nice to have those dreams, but how do you actually achieve those dreams? And that's one of the biggest challenges I think we are facing. Now, over the last 15, 20 years, the term digital divide has been used uh, widely. A lot of economies, a lot of countries have invested a lot in trying to bridge the digital divide. Um, and much progress has been made. However, if we look at where things are today, it really concerns me that we are actually creating new digital divides. If you look at how some of countries, some advanced countries, for example, this one where we are now, Korea, how it has used technology to improve its economy, its socioeconomic development, things are very different here to what they are, let's say, in the Pacific Island countries or in some parts of Southeast Asia or some parts of South Asia. Uh, a lot of effort has to be made into achieving these uh, somewhat lofty dreams and aspirations that sometimes we hear when we go to conferences and things. It will not be achievable for everyone as they are presented to you. Because for one, there are issues about how will you finance all these projects. Number two, where will the capacity come for the projects uh, to, to build them, to operate them, to design them, to maintain them. So these are some of the, you know, what I would call the larger development challenges that we are facing and very particular, that goes down to some of the smaller and developing countries, not just in this region, but around the world, of course. A lot of work is being, of course, done in terms of trying to build capacity, be it technical capacity, be it policy capacity, be it regulatory capacity. But when you look at, uh, again, if I take Asia Pacific as an example, we are also the most disaster prone region of the world. Once disaster strikes, so much effort has to go into rebuilding. Very recently, Indonesia, uh, we had uh, a tsunami there. A couple of years ago in, in, in Nepal, we had a massive earthquake. In the Pacific Islands, we've had several cyclones go through, affecting uh, multiple countries, and so on and so forth. Once something like that happens, a lot of effort is, uh, goes into the rebuilding, which means time, money, resources. So having the digital aspirations, and just about every country in the region has digital aspirations, but all will take a different track to get there, all will have different levels of development in, in trying to achieve what they would like to achieve in terms of digital. Um, the other issue I think that has, uh, is impacting uh, digital transformation. In some parts of the world, there is a great acceleration in what we do with digital. As an example, the sharing economy has changed the way we order taxis or, or take a trip between two uh, locations. Uh, how we book hotels or seek accommodation. That brings into question a couple of very interesting regulatory questions as well. For example, um, if you, and let me take Australia as an example, if you uh, have a taxi in Australia, the taxi owner has to do a lot of things in order to be able to drive the taxi. There's licenses to be paid, uh, insurance, very specific insurance policies that need to be taken out, and of course there's the industry uh, codes and regulations that they have to follow. But a sharing um, economy, uh, let's say Uber or, or Grab, as in Southeast Asia, they don't necessarily have the same restrictions based on them. So it's not really a level playing field when you look at those two uh, business owners who are trying to do what they want to do. And when it comes to the regulatory perspective, where does the regulation, and I'm just using transportation as an example, where does, this, does that actually fit in? Is it the Department or Ministry of Road and Transport? Or is it the digital uh, economy? Is it the ICT economy, uh, ministry, sorry? And so on and so forth. So, so there's some interesting questions that are being put forward on you know, where this blurring of responsibilities, regulatory responsibilities, how do we actually bridge that gap? I'm, I'm mindful I only have eight minutes, and I've been told I have less than three minutes left now, so I will skip through a lot of things I was going to say. Uh, and let me, but I'm here for the rest of the day, so please feel free to come up and uh, have a debate or dialogue with me, as you would please. Um, in terms of how do we get there, so very quickly, no one entity, organization can do it on its own. The UN cannot do it either on its own. We need collaboration across multiple stakeholder groups. Partnerships are critical with the private sector, with civil societies and NGOs and other organizations that are working in the space. When you develop the policy, you know, 
we all said things have changed since we've all gone digital. Since the internet has changed the world. You know, we are far better informed, sometimes misinformed, far better misinformed as well. We have you know, access to information, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives us a great opportunity that when we actually develop policy, whatever that policy may be, there's far greater input that can go into the process. Beyond that, how we actually engage with our constituencies, our people, our citizens in getting the, development, the policy development process in place, digital, um, the internet, and, and um, the web, of course, gives us far greater opportunity to do that than we could have done in the past. The last bit is multi-stakeholder collaboration. Um, having all these people as part of the dialogue from different sectors, from different stakeholder groups is critical. Without that, I don't think we can formulate policy for tomorrow. We'd still be formulating policy for yesterday. Um, the rest of the slides talk about some of the things that we've done, so I'll skip over some of them. Um, just very briefly, we do a lot of work around gender, and particularly mainstreaming um, women and minority communities to be able to use the internet and ICTs. We've done some work around education, uh, so this is, of course, targeting the SDGs. Um, in t um, one great example, again, I'm happy to talk about it offline to you, is a, a pilot project we did in Pakistan with a girls' school in a rural location. And the interesting thing, you know, as you would expect, the attendance rates went up, their um, academic skills went up, and all that happened within four months. The girls wanted to come to school. They wanted to learn. They were, you know, and what we did was we had a remote teacher from uh, Islamabad who was teaching this uh, rural kids. I'm being told I have no time left. There's things on digital accessibility, uh, IoT. I believe the slides will be up uh, on the website, so please feel free to download them. Um, it's a pity I don't have much time to talk about IoT. Someone talked about cybersecurity. There's a lot of things we need to deal with, and perhaps in the discussion session later, we can cover some of those. Thank you very much, and please visit our website for more information. Thank, Thank you very much, Mr. Singh. Okay, you can. Uh, I would like to open the floor uh, so that you can raise a question to Mr. Singh. Oh, so I can get a few more minutes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Just one, oh, please. So you are referring to the framework for policymakers. So what kind of framework you are thinking about the future? So essentially what, um, so, so there's a full document that you can download to read more about that. Uh, essentially what we're saying is when you develop that framework, and what, as I said, the policy can be anything you're working on. It could be e-government, it could be regulating the transport industry, whatever it may be. But the process that you go through to, to develop that policy has to be far more, um, I'm trying to think of a diplomatic word here, far more open to various um, input. Some of it may be critical input. Uh, some of it may be negative input. But I think in today's age, you have to be able to balance all those different viewpoints and see what is the best policy you can formulate based on that. So the document actually goes through the process as well. I'd invite you to have a look at that. And please. Sorry? Yes, demand based, exactly. Okay, thank you very much, yeah. Mr. Singh. Uh, our uh, third uh, topic is making the most of the fourth industrial revolution for Africa by uh, 23. Um, uh, this, on this topic, we would like to discuss potentials of this revolution for achieving sustainable goals, especially in Africa and opportunities of this frontier technology for developing, for developing countries to catch up and actions taken by the governments to promote growing prosperity while effectively managing these growing inequalities. Now I would like to invite Mr. Sunil Jinis, Director of Global Digital Government, SAP Africa. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. How are you guys doing out there? It's warm now, right? And I'm almost the last speaker, and I'm between you and lunch, so I'm going to keep it short and focused, and I'm hoping to get a bit of interaction going on uh, so that it's not just one-way traffic here. So my name is Sunil. I live in South Africa, and I'm going to talk about a massive continent. I cannot do justice to that in eight minutes, but 
for those who don't know that uh, the size of Africa is equivalent to fitting China, India, Western Europe, North America, South America, and a few islands in the Pacific, just to give you an idea. So it's massive, it's a massive continent. So without further ado, let me go into the presentation. Now, what was good to see is that many, many people didn't take it for granted to talk about this fourth industrial revolution. In Africa, when we talk about this, it's often important for us to emphasize what exactly that is. But you've heard that from the previous speakers. And I want to talk a little bit about the African economy. Essentially, Africa is driven by an agrarian economy. 80% uh, of the food is produced by subsistence farmers. Of course, the multinationals are there as well to contribute towards the efforts of uh, food security, etc. But within all of this is a great opportunity for the fourth industrial revolution to take Africa's people, which has the youngest population on the continent. And by 2030, we see uh, extrapolations of figures that the world's population will reach around 9 billion, of which at least 1 billion will be in Africa. So there's a huge opportunity for Africans, young Africans at that. And with that brings a lot of opportunities to the rest of the world at the same time. Now, we heard about data. We say that data is the new gold or platinum um, in the world. And what's happening, you've seen from our presenter from China as well, is that data is now being used on a locational basis. And Africa can benefit from that in terms of the urbanization trends that we see, also in terms of the shift of younger people moving into more tech-savvy kind of roles and opportunities and taking advantage of the digital divide. Data, of course, also presents a huge problem. <clears throat> you all saw the challenges that Facebook uh, faced recently uh, with the elections in the United States. And therefore, the sovereignty of data is also quite important. And what we've seen now in Europe is the introduction of GDPR, which is General Data Protection Regulations. And this is something in Africa that we're looking at as well, uh, because with this burgeoning population, we'd also want to make sure that there is sovereignty of data of individuals and countries as such. Now, we've heard about artificial intelligence. You felt it. Some of you went out to the fire station yesterday where you saw what robots could do. But I want you to look at this graph. It was a study done in 2016. OK, it's a little dated. but. What this graph basically shows is that the study predicts, and even if we go to the extreme right, uh, where Korea is mentioned, that artificial intelligence and the implementation thereof can literally double the GDP of countries, the growth of countries. So why is this important for Africa? Because Africa is not growing at a very fast rate. In some cases, 1% to 2%. In other places in Africa, you might find it at 7%. And the belief is, through artificial intelligence, um, Africa can become much more prosperous by tapping into some of the development that's happened in, in the rest of the world. And of course, these are all developing countries. At the same time, the policy framework around artificial intelligence. Now, let's just pause there for a minute. Is there anyone here from Venezuela? South America? OK, a couple of months back, the Venezuelan president was giving a talk, and do you recall what happened? Some, yes, you recall what happened. There were some drones that entered the space and set off small-sized explosives. Okay, just think about that. Now, uh, just six weeks before that, I was talking at a conference in Durban, and I emphasized that the policy framework around artificial intelligence is critical be it in Korea, the Republic of Korea, or Venezuela, or Africa. And we need a lot of attention to be paid to that. And at the same time, African governments need to take this into account. The ITU, the International Telecom Union, which is a sister organization, um, recently held a conference in Durban, in South Africa. And of course, somebody said that by 2050, artificial intelligence will be able to replicate the human brain capacity. Early on, we saw also from our colleague from the World Economic Forum, there were some questions about when uh, uh, you know, a 
human liver could be uh, printed in 3D, etc. But just think about it and pause for a minute. But at the same time, this talks about the future of work. So for Africans, the future of work will change tremendously because more and more of them will get out of this agrarian economy and try to take advantage of the digital economy. And globally, what we're seeing is that, and the predictive is that, jobs which involve mundane activities. I hope there's no accountants in the room. Are there accountants here? Anybody? Okay, accountants, 94% of them, most of their functions will be automated. And you can see the trend, it moves on because of the limited time. I'm not gonna read all of that out to you. What we're seeing in Africa as well is that there's an aggregation, and the previous speakers touched on this. In South Africa, for example, in uh, Cape Town, Johannesburg, and Pretoria, what we're seeing is the integration of smart cities. The actual platform of utilizing technology to ensure that citizen-centric government becomes much more personalized. And um, because of limited time, of course, these slides will be made available to you. I cannot go through each of this. I want to touch on one of the other technologies, blockchain. So if you don't know what a blockchain is, that's fine, it's, it's all right not to know that, but you, know the, you need to know the impact. And one person described blockchain as, if you ever wanted a god, quote unquote, please, I don't want to sound blasphemous, to overlook transactions, then blockchain is it. Because basically it's a distributed ledger, which means transactions can take place and there can be a security network built into those transactions. And the South African government, the Reserve Bank of all institutions, is using blockchain through a program called Project COCA, where they're able to dispense or, or work with other intermediary banks to ensure the uh, integrity of data, et cetera. At the same time, the company that I work for, SAP, which is the third largest software company in the world by market capitalization, has recently introduced a private blockchain. And some of the applications that can benefit Africa, because Africa is a recipient of a whole lot of medical supplies. Some of it comes from, even from Korea. And if you think about a ship traveling from here all the way to Africa, the delta or the difference in temperatures as you move through the different zones can affect the, um, the, the, the value of the, the product and also the integrity of the product. And by using Internet of Things, we believe that this can be uh, monitored, the temperature of these products can be monitored. Same thing with flour, which is uh, you know, used widely in Africa as well. Then just to my last two slides, um, some of us spoke, time is over, but I need 30 seconds. Um, I, because I mean, the, the previous speakers like eroded two and a half, two and a half minutes, so I'm gonna take this 30 seconds. Is, is that okay? It's, all right. Now, um, our colleague from Bangladesh also touched on this and the questions earlier on. Cybersecurity is a huge thing. In um, September, there was a Cybersecurity Global Week. Do you remember this? Any of you participated in that? But basically in cybersecurity, there are three aspects, technology, process, and people. What most of these breaches have shown is that it's the people who are the problem, right? In South Africa, we have a company called Liberty, which is a financial services house. Its entire, or almost all of its clients' data was compromised in a recent cyber attack. You've heard of ransomware, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we look at, this is my penultimate slide, how do we see life in Africa by 2030? We're looking at life in Africa where infrastructure is improved, that data costs are driven down. It's very, very expensive in Africa compared to uh, Europe, uh, Southeast Asia, and, and also the Americas where healthcare becomes something that is accessible. Yesterday we heard the Chinese professor talk about what they're doing in China around healthcare. We want to bring that over. Same with education, the use of virtual reality to get educational concepts into rural areas because of the, the, the vast expanse. And uh, low resource communities, service robots. We heard yesterday that someone said, I think it was Professor Han who said, we should tax robots because they are developing GDP capabilities, all right? And they're off. And lastly, public safety and security. Then I want to leave you with this, you know, goal 17, which I'm looking at right there, is partnerships for the goals, goal 17. And I really like this here, because these goals, if you think of it philosophically, is giving you some protection from the sun, but it's also protecting the future of mankind. So I don't want you to forget that. 
So SAP, with a number of partners, have introduced a program in Africa called the Africa Code Week program. Our belief is that every African child should learn how to code. We started this in 2015. We've hit like 1.8 million uh, people already. Almost 50% of them are girls, 36 countries, and Google's one of our partners. And these are the type of partnerships that Africa is looking for. Africa is not looking for you to just come over and vandalize its profitability. The returns in Africa are more than eight to tenfold. But partnership is key. I'm gonna leave it on, note, on that note and thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, like previous speaker, I would like to have one question from the floor. Uh, thank you for presentation. And in your slide, uh, several uh, uh, plenty slide, and also you all mentioned the account and uh, editor occupy about ninety percent. About ninety percent. I want to know how about the software in a year? Software in a year occupy how much? You you. It, I didn't get the question. Yeah. Software. Yeah. So software in a year. Yeah. Software. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, Thank great, you. great question. We have a challenge in Africa. Software engineers are like gold dust. We need more software engineers. We're looking for partnership around that. Part of that is because of the colonial history of Africa where lots of Africans have said, please go and study arts. Please, I have nothing against artists. I, I, I have a physics background. Please study arts and please study languages because that's where you should be. But with more and more of these countries coming into um, independence, we're seeing now that science, technology, engineering, and mathematics is increasing, and we need support from China and other countries to exchange information. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. You look, yeah. Uh, the uh, last uh, the speaker is from uh, Uh, he's a Deputy Minister, Ministry of Communication and Information Technology, Afghanistan, Mr. Mohammed uh, Hedayati. Please. Um, excellencies, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, and yourself. It's my proud privilege to be here, and uh, I learned a lot uh, so far, the uh, very nice presentation. Uh, we learned that the uh, fourth industrial revolution uh, reshaped the world, and uh, it's because of the uh, becoming uh, closer the uh, artificial and natural intelligence. Um, and it is uh, good to say that we should uh, acknowledge the uh, development of technology, but sometimes it's some kind of challenging to be a human. Okay, my presentation is not too long because I'm the last. I know everybody is very tired and uh, we had a panel discussion too. So I, I'm trying to uh, uh, focus on the regional connectivity uh, uh, between different countries. So although uh, different countries have some connectivity through fiber optic ne network and, and some other uh, technologies. But still, the contribution is very, very less. Uh, although technology made the, the world like a village, but still, we need more contribution. If we look to the Facebook, as uh, mentioned by a previous uh, speaker from South Africa, that uh, we feel that we are in the same village and we can communicate, interact with different people, different uh, nationality. Um, but the, still, you know, uh, each country has uh, its own culture, its own policy uh, strategy. But uh, if we look to the technology development, especially as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, my friend, uh, blockchain. Blockchains offer uh, bitcoins. So every country now its own currency. Now technology offers us to have the same currency. And this made the huge 
and largest bank in the world, the Bitcoins. So, uh, as we had saw it visit yesterday, Korea developed a lot. And surely I can say that one day we'll see that the mobile phone will emit oxygen rather than uh, uh, radiation. So it will happen. And uh, the connectivity between different countries uh, uh, will be more useful while we're using the technology development, like uh, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, uh, and uh, robotics, and some other development. So the current status of Afghanistan, although we, we are the, the, the post-conflict country, uh, but we have some activities with regard to the ICT. We have two huge projects which is responsible for the regional connectivity called Digital COSA and Silk Road projects. So the main objective of these two projects are connect the Central Asian countries to the uh, South uh, Asian countries. With regard to sustainable development, we also contribute uh, um, uh, SDGs, so we have different working groups, and we have a clear uh, policy to achieve the, the goals. Uh, you can see here the, the main con uh, connection, uh, uh, focus is connectivity with the fiber optic, which is uh, man managed in, in Kabul. So, in Afghanistan, we have more than 90% uh, mobile coverage area. And uh, uh, for the providing 4G uh, connectivity communication, uh, the uh, coverage area is uh, more than 70%. And uh, for the some area that we don't have fiber optic networks, we are trying to use satellite. And uh, we're plan planning to use, uh, OK, uh, uh, 24 transponders. And the cost of the internet uh, is reducing day by day. So as you see in this map, I'm trying to, to, to show the, the geographical area of Afghanistan uh, that connects the uh, Central Asian countries with the South Asian countries. And now this is the, the, if you see the red light, we are trying to connect Afghanistan via China, and the survey is done, and uh, the uh, plan is to connect uh, these two countries very soon. And then Afghanistan can play as a hub. So some investment is there, so I'm trying to skip this slide, but only some beautiful ladies from Afghanistan, they are the first robotic teams that they are ready to race the different matches. So um, uh, uh, for the partnership di between different uh, uh, countries, like uh, uh, developed and developing countries, so we know that the people in developed countries already enjoyed the development of technology. But they, they, we are expect, uh, expecting them to have the, the plan to regulate new capabilities for the developing countries. Mainly, this development will, will be somehow low skill, low pay, and high skill, high pay. Uh, some challenges are there, and the biggest challenge already raised by the participant is security. And it is clearly also mentioned that uh, the challenges uh, is uh, not with the technology, it is with the people. So now we need the support from developed country to uh, developing countries to, to uh, help the different competency for the protection of the entire world. So I must escape because uh, some, some notice are there. Um, uh, I'm trying to conclude uh, the presentation. This development is more 
will be more useful while we have the uh, connectivity and contribution between different countries. So let us be hope for the more uh, contribution. And thank you very much for the attendance. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for all uh, excellent uh, seven speakers. And now we would like to, since we have about 35 minutes, I understand you must be hungry by now. And uh, we have just uh, a little more than 30 minutes. Uh, I left my house this morning at 7 o'clock because this was, uh, for, for me, this was first time to drive by myself. So I try a little earlier than, and so I'm really hungry right now. <laughs> so probably you may feel the same. Now uh, we have 35 minutes and we will invite all our speakers on the podium and uh, this is uh, I, uh, the more like interactive uh, discussion. The topic is on capacities needed to make institutions more effective and to take advantage of new technologies to advance the SDG. We have here, we have about uh, five questions for interactive discussion. So we will move on. Uh, we will start from the first question so that we can have uh, more uh, the free flowing and more to stimulate the participatory and active discussion. Would you like to, uh, I would like to invite all speakers. Okay, uh, we will start from uh, this first uh, question. What are major impact of the fourth industrial revolution on governance models, redefining the role of public sector, pub, private, public, and civil societies? Uh, I suggest that we can focus on this question, and I would like to uh, open the floor for from on this first topic. Uh, from one of the speakers, if you have any uh, comments or quest I mean, comments and interventions. Wow, that's pretty good. Please. So it goes to what I was uh, briefly trying to say when I was speaking earlier. Um, the fact is that today's citizen is a far more informed citizen, to a large extent, uh, in most countries than there were, let's say, 10, 15, 20, or even five years ago. Uh, so what that uh, presents governments, I think, uh, is both an opportunity as well as, as, uh, as well as a challenge. The opportunity, of course, is you can have far better informed um, input into your governance processes. Um, the challenge, of course, is are you prepared to actually listen to the, that input and take that on board? Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, some of that input may actually be critic, highly critical. It could be negative as well. So the, 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 the trick is how do you balance all those different perspectives? Um, not doing that is not an option, I do not think, going forward. Uh, there's just far too many ways to access information and to exchange information and to inform others about what your opinions are. So I think uh, the onus itself is on governments. Some governments are doing that very well, I must say. Some governments, I think, need a bit more help uh, to get there. Yes, I'd like to welcome all comments or questions or any uh, intervention from the floor from now. Please. Sorry, your question is, do, you, do I think more information is more challenging? Processing that information, of course, is where the challenge is. Um, as an example, um, you know, many, many years ago when I used to do a bit of work around telecom regulation, um, and this is before deregulation became a thing, so this is going way back. The point was that, you know, most of the decisions were made by the ministry in question, maybe the incumbent telecom operator and a few other invited expert consultants. That's how policy was developed. Today, if you do that, it's not going to work out very well. Um, the advantage back then was, of course, you only have a few points of view, and it's far easier to reach consensus or a decision if you only have, let's say, half a dozen uh, different viewpoints or perspectives. Today, let's say in a country like India, you can potentially have a billion different perspectives on, on a particular point. So that's where I think the challenge is. And how do you actually sort that information between you know, what is relevant, what is not relevant, and how do you apply it to the actual process you're following at the moment? That's where I think the challenge is. 
Yes. Uh, thank you. Please. I'd like to take off from what was mentioned by our colleague from Afghani Afghanistan and also from uh, South Africa. In one of your slides, you said that government, the dangerous government will be aloof from its people. And that, I think, is very, very paradoxical because government is supposed to provide the solution, but as a matter of fact, because of it, it lacks its capacities, it worsens the problem. Many times, government can be the problem rather than the solution. What do you think of that? And coming off from what you said, because you also said that the problem really is the people, etc. cetera. Um, thank you very much for your uh, question. Uh, I don't think that uh, government, any government can, can be an obstacle for the technology development. Uh, uh, but uh, somehow, yeah, it, it, it can be, you know, in different uh, way that we can ask that how can we have different collaboration and different contribution from different stakeholders uh, to, to align together and to work together and to uh, go for the uh, specific goals. So um, in, in case of Afghanistan, so um, most of the uh, responsibility mainly for the infrastructure development and uh, 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 bringing new technologies in the country. So it's, it's more uh, uh, mandate of the government. And also we have some um, private uh, partnership. Thank you. Please. Uh, in one of the presentations, you touched upon the sharing economy and, and the disruptions it can create and the challenges for governance and regulation. I was just thinking based on your expertise, uh, which country would you point to as the best practice in terms of governance of this kind of, eco uh, you know, the emerging sharing economy, the Airbnbs, the Ubers, etc. So I don't want to hog the microphone, but I was the one who mentioned the sharing economy. So I'll just very briefly say, um, I think you would be hard pressed to find a country that has done it well. I think most countries are struggling with it at various levels. Um, you know, a lot of people look at Singapore as a great example of what it has done with digital and becoming a smart city, smart nation. But even Singapore is struggling with uh, regulation of the sharing economy, particularly the Uber, uh, the ride sharing uh, angle. So, you know, I don't think there's one fit model. My suggestion would be you look at what various countries are doing, even the Philippines, for example, has been struggling a little bit. Um, and, and then you need to see how that would fit into your context. Um, there's a lot of different papers and studies out there, a lot, lot of different discussions, sometimes with differing viewpoints. Um, but one thing I would highly suggest is that you need to involve your local stakeholders as part of the process. Don't just look at getting something from overseas of what someone's done and, and try and bring that in locally because it's your taxi drivers, your transport industry, your hotel operators which will be affected by this. So that's where their input is critical, I would say. Sorry, sir. So uh, I think uh, the European Union has done some work in this regard and they've proposed something for uh, the territories in the European Union based on some of those developed countries I showed in the map earlier on uh, in Europe, that's one example to look at uh, particularly. I think Korea is another example. We had a great presentation from the IT quote unquote agency here and the kind of work that they are, are, are doing here in, uh, in Korea as well. So those would be two examples that uh, jump to mind. From a private sector perspective, of course, we are interested in driving a profit motive. We want to make a difference with communities and things like that. But you could have something which is this thing called races to the bottom, cheaper products, all that kind of thing, which compromises the governance framework. It's very important that we have global standards on artificial intelligence, the use of it, because of the way countries trade. We're seeing now more and more you're getting these e-ports which come up. Um, and, and here, right in Incheon, you have an, uh, an e-port, the way that you transact and so on. China has that as well. Africa is looking at that uh, very much so. The more and more frameworks that we have in place, like BRICS, like uh, the G20, uh, G7, etc., and the amalgamation, the more you need standardization. So I think the world needs more of that standardization. I'm not asking for more regulation. What I'm asking for is specific regulations with minimum standards. Okay. Okay. Please. Uh, 
I uh, answer in word because you want to become uh, from developed country to uh, developed country, but I think the most important is the education. You should try your best to train more and more talents in your country, and also digital uh, digital productivity become grow uh, become bigger and bigger from from your talents. And also, you can also join the projects such just as this mist. Uh, you can, for example, one by time, one road, and international collaboration. The collaboration is, uh, is the second role I uh, pay attention to. Because uh, if one country has only one finger, but if we collaborate together, we can just to like, do uh, more and more good things and help your country become strong and stronger. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, now I would like to move to the second uh, the topic, second questions. How can legal and ethical framework be adapted to frontier technology and the post-industrial revolution? In between, you, of course, you can raise questions, the presentations, of the uh, previous speakers. Yes? If you don't have any questions on, okay, please. I thought it, you, you were not interested in this topic. <laughs> So good afternoon, everyone. So my question is from the senior colleague from South Africa. Uh, with regard to the ethical framework, so the ethical framework, is there any uh, kind of a best practice that any government has been able to you know, adopt and uh, implement? Is there any uh, specific example from any country which is right now you know, established as the best practice for the ethical framework because when we talk about the uh, uh, whether it is a cyber revolution or an industrial revolution so the morality and the ethical framework is something uh, which I feel the citizens specifically who are the major stakeholders so they have to adopt to this so is there any specific best practice for that thank you So um, thanks for the question. Before we get to that question, I, I, I think we need to contextualize this because we're talking about legal and ethical frameworks. Um, one of the most important things in the world is healthcare, right? And um, globally, what we're seeing is that, uh, even we saw this yesterday, is that the data of the patient becomes very, very important. And I'm leading to something, and I'm going to come to quote your example. So what has happened recently in the European Union is that they passed or accepted the regulation that data can be dislocated from the region in which it's actually created. What that means basically is if a company is sitting in Colombia, it could have the data of Indian patients in their repository. That was passed recently, which means it opened up a lot and it's private sector led, which means that companies that deal with data and delivering of services, et cetera, could work across cross borders. Now, to look at best practices, you need to see where artificial intelligence is at its peak. I quoted five countries earlier on. United States was there, Germany, um, South Korea, Republic of Korea was in, in that. And I think these are countries that we need to look to. India, by the way, has its own um, e-India policy, which is coming, I think it's a 2020 policy, and it's adopted a number of these regulations and is trying to implement that. That's as, as close as it gets. Okay, thank you very much. Any other questions or comments from the floor? Uh, then uh, we would like to move on to the uh, next uh, question. The, uh, how can developing countries catch up with the post industrial revolution and promoting prosperity while effectively managing growing inequalities. Anyone from the uh, speaker would like to respond on this question before I open the floor? Yeah, please. Um, 
this is becoming, this is the last time I'll speak. I won't speak anymore after this, I promise. Um, you know, so this is a question that I have been part of uh, conversations many, many times. Um, and always my answer has relatively been the same. You need a whole of government approach. You know, you cannot be working in silos in government in, if you want to, um, if you want your country to get up, catch up to the fourth industrial revolution. What's happening in some countries that we see, you know, the, the, largely the ICT-based ministries are the ones who are looking into this, but the other sectors, uh, I think Sunil mentioned about the healthcare, for example, all the other sectors will be impacted by this. So you can't just have the ICT guys working on this in a silo on their own. You have to have all other different departments and ministries across government, even you know, the smallest ministries, because at some point in time, they will be impacted by what decisions are being made based on this. So that's why it's critical to have a whole of government approach, that's one. Number two, you need to have, you know, does your government have a chief digital officer or a chief government CIO officer, or whatever you want to term that person? But that should not be running the IT, IT systems of the government and departments. That person should be looking at what the country can achieve by using, embracing the opportunities that ICTs provide. And sometimes I see a disconnect between that position, someone's put in the, into that role, but what their responsibilities are, are quite different. You know, you don't want the guy to go fix your network and your printers. He should be focusing on what tomorrow will bring to the country. So that, those two things I would stress on. Chair, may, may I add a, a couple of points on this? So the way that developing countries can benefit from this is firstly, not to accept sep second grade technology. So first world countries should not dump technology that has been, uh, is not up to the standard of the latest development. That's the first thing. That will enable these developing countries to leapfrog. They, they literally have to do that because some of them are still caught up in, in, in the past. And I, I suppose this, the second area is what can be done to reduce this digital divide that seems to be increasing in some of the developing countries. And that talks to skilling. It talks to our curriculum. Now, yesterday we had the presentation from my esteemed colleague here from Yundesa on e-government. And what you saw there is that only five countries in Africa, based on that e-government strategy, were, was above the median. Essentially what it means is that government needs to relook itself. It needs to keep up with the time. We cannot have, quote unquote, to quote uh, Professor Han, dumb governments. We need governments to embrace private sector. Private sector is not the enemy of government. Private sector is your friend. Because they put in most of the R&D, they do all the research, they are collaborating, of course they want to drive profits. But that is how developing countries can take advantage of these new technologies is to create the right frameworks so the e-government and, they, and their readiness, their readiness to embrace e-government and eventually what we could now know as digital government. I think this is critical. And if anyone disagrees with me, please put your hand up and shoot me. If I could just ask you a follow-up question. A lot of the fourth industrial revolution talk and presentations we've seen is a bit beyond where developing countries are. And, uh, and I also uh, wanted your thought on you know, the promise of leapfrogging. What if you had to choose one thing that developing countries could do to, to leapfrog and take advantage of the fourth industrial revolution, what it is that we should do and second, uh, I think in one of your presentations, you mentioned about, uh, about uh, giving people not just focus on numeracy, literacy, but now talking about a fourth, uh, a third or a fourth language, coding. And also wondering which country might be a good example of coding being introduced as a basic skill in the education system. It's also be my last uh, feedback. Thank you for the question. Sure. So I, if you look at life in general, every one of you remembers your grade one teacher. I mean, I know for some of us it's a long time ago. That's where everything starts. We need to empower teachers. If teachers are empowered, they act as accelerators. And that's what that Africa Code Week program that we're talking about, we're looking to address 70,000 teachers across Africa. Of course, it's not a great number, but that's where they start to get them into computational thinking. 
The second thing is to introduce this concept into schools. Morocco, Cote d'Ivoire, and now the rest of African governments are actually screaming out that coding should be introduced in school. Every child will not become a coder, but they will be exposed to it, which means you've got a greater chance of having the kind of engineers that my colleague, my esteemed colleague from China is talking about. And that's where it all starts. You, I'm sorry, are going to be a forgotten generation in the next 15 to 20 years. It's the future. We've got to target the future. That is the epicenter and the fulcrum of everything that will come. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, uh, we have two more questions, and let's move on to the uh, next question. The first question is, how would the fourth industrial revolution affect the future of cooperation partnership between developed and developing countries in the face of possible rising inequalities between countries? If you would like to respond from, yeah. I think uh, it will make uh, the uh, collaboration very tightly and uh, fast and uh, uh, friendship. Also, uh, the uh, web for uh, in the uh, yeah. In the years uh, before, we can, cannot contact. We have to, if we want to, uh, to visit you, I have to come to with you. But now we can visit each other uh, with the web. For example, WeChat and other uh, uh, app software. Also, in, when you want to learn good and better knowledge, you cannot go get sight, and you can learn it online. And also, you can also care for your parents in, on home, in home, but the, the foundation of it is the digital, digital city or, because it is the information infrastructure. And also, if you have no such uh, infrastructure, you may ask for help from the international corporation. For example, we sit here and to seek for the co cooperation between us. And also, finally, it is a good thing because for the, someone asked, tell me, it is a global village. So we are the, also the citizenship who live in the global uh, the village. And uh, we will communicate and uh, friendship and uh, cooperation very fast and friendly. Yes, uh, we would like to move on to the, uh, the final questions is how can international organizations, especially the United Nations, as the neutral platform can manage these transboundary issues such as digital waste disposal, data privacy, and data governance and cybersecurity? Anyone from, yeah. Sir, I want to touch on just the previous question for sure, a minute yeah, and yeah, a second one. So I want to give an example of um, the kind of cooperation that's happening. Next week uh, in Berlin, Germany is hosting something which is called the Africa Compact. If you haven't seen what that is, uh, please take a, take a moment later to just Google it. But basically, it's a first world country during its G20 presidency that made this decree. And essentially, that's the kind of partnerships we're looking for. We're looking at partnerships where developed countries work with developing countries and put in place documented, measurable things. What gets measured gets done. Too often, there's high-level talks, and we never ever see the tangibility of it. So that's an example, and, and I encourage you to look at that. And if you're in government, that's what you should be forcing your heads of state to be doing when this G20 presidency moves around, et cetera, or whatever region you're in. Then on the, um, the, 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 the second question around the United Nations. Now, the UN has many, many bodies. The ITU has, uh, you know, it's focusing on e-government. It's looked at the issues of uh, data uh, in terms of skill set. But it's come out with a very interesting report, which is not even three weeks old. This report speaks to the impact of data access to economic development. 
Have, have any of you seen the report? Please Google it. Have a look at that report. It's critical, and I think the research combined with the e-government report provides governments with a very good platform from which to extrapolate their policy perspective. That's the first thing. The second thing is, policy needs to be empirically based. It must be evidence-based policy making, not policy making that is based on whim and fancy of governments. Of course, you know, to stay in government is important and build your constituency. And I suppose the third thing is that these multilateral agencies have got to do a lot more in terms of streamlining the impact of what they're doing. You may find that there is duplication. So I, I do believe they're doing a great job. However, we can streamline that and those resources can be brought to bear in a much more impactful way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, please. From the floor, we may enjoy uh, two or three more questions and comments, and then we can close. Please. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, uh, good presentation. Thank you very much for the uh, kind presentation. Actually, um, my question is like more concerned to the first question and the third question and the fourth question all together. Usually uh, what you are talking is the impact of the fourth industrial revolution on the developing countries and uh, in the whole world and especially for the developing countries. But mostly what we focused on were the benefits of this, uh, the, the fourth industrial revolution. The problem is that there are also some costs that I think that this and fourth industrial revolution has on developing countries. And especially, as we know, because they are developing countries, the gap between the developing and the developed countries, it makes the developing countries to be reactive more on what's available on the developed countries. So, so usually the policies that they plan is more about how to catch up with the developing uh, and, and, and developed countries and what's available in the market at that period. But usually what happens is, for example, most of the developing countries, they didn't go through the, the other stages of the develop, and, and industrial revolution, like the, pre, the first and, and, and developing, uh, the first industrial revolution, the second, the third, the fourth. And today we are talking about the fourth industrial re revolution. And the, are these countries prepared for adapting with this fourth industrial revolution? Especially, for example, people usually they study more about what is available and how they can catch up in the future. But when they study, for example, the government makes the policy, and then after they, when they want to uh, apply that policy, the, world, the developing countries already move it to another stage of the development. And then again, they, they plan, they plan, they plan. So like, like this, because, so through this way, it makes like more dependent on the developed countries instead of becoming, making like cooperation between those two things. So just in short form, what is the causes for this fourth industrial revolution on developing countries? That's my question. At the center, you are responsible for <laughs> responding. <laughs> yeah, I try to uh, answer all uh, combined questions, uh, but in regard to the Afghanistan uh, instances that they, uh, they, the cost and the uh, value of the uh, implementation and bringing new technologies is, is, is very difficult because uh, we have different situation from, from other developing countries. Uh, still we are suffering from the uh, suicide attackers and uh, our um, um, energy, uh, more than 90% of the energy is uh, uh, considered for the uh, uh, civil uh, protection. So uh, the thing is that still we have the um, uh, motivation and we are hoping to have uh, a uh, good future and contribute in the region. So that's why I presented and, and mentioned uh, many times for the regional connectivity. So once we, we have the regional connectivity via Afghanistan, uh, we can have more uh, uh, income through, through that and also we can provide uh, uh, services through different uh, countries in the region. 
please. Yeah, please. So I, I think the gentleman that raised the question, if I remember correctly, you from the uh, from the DR Congo, if I remember correctly, which is on my continent, if I remember correctly. Now, the role that development organizations, for example, the African Development Bank, the African Union, um, UNDESA has an office, I think, also in Addis, is critical to support uh, developing countries. Um, there's grant making which is available from uh, some of these uh, mon uh, international organizations. So that's a one thing. The second thing is developing countries have got to take responsibility for their own future. We cannot be going out there repeatedly. Of course we have a past which we've dealt with, be it colonialism, be it conflict regions, etc. that we have to deal with. But it speaks to government leadership. It speaks to the leadership of presidents in developing countries and heads of state and themselves, the advisory people that they have around them in driving this. If you do good, people will notice it. People will accept that as something that's progressive and they'll come to the party and invest. And the way to attract investment is to uh, have uh, regulatory frameworks which enable investment to happen in a way where funding is secured, etc. So I think it's a two-way street. Uh, as much as uh, you know, uh, the challenges exist, Afghanistan, I know, is, is a very difficult environment. I was chatting last night to a member of parliament who's sitting here with us about the scenario in, in Afghanistan. But we, developing countries have also got to step up to the plate. Thank you so much. And uh, we have five minutes. And so I would like to, I have a reporter's note and it will take 10 minutes. So I'm not going to read all of this. I just want to highlight within three minutes and so that we can enjoy our lunch. Uh, just uh, the uh, three points, uh, the key issues we have discussed, dur addressed during this session is the most of the government suffers issues relating to its focus on processes of digitalization, web-based services and increasing digital divide. And second point is massive citizen data needs to be collected, analyzed effectively. And the uh, third point is new problems are created as countries move forward their digital transformation. And the second part is key messages from the presentation and discussion. As the uh, core technological uh, the, uh, the agenda in the e-government, the government is moving from digitalization to integration of intelligent technologies to be intelligent government. This is one point. The other point is the end goal is to create social values aligned with SDGs. The other point is uh, artificial intelligence could accelerate the digital divide by placing a premium on high-skilled workers and also at the same time reducing the demand for low-skilled workers. By uh, 2025, top three trends would be wearable tech, robotics, healthcare, and 3D printed vehicles. And the last uh, point is policy recommendations. It's uh, make open data compulsory and improve data quality. Second point is strengthening public-private sector engagement where private sector can drive relevant services for electronic government. And clarity of regular, uh, regulatory responsibility is also needed. And the last point, uh, last part of the policy recommendation is appropriate global equitabilities are required for different types of countries to reap benefits of the uh, digital techn technologies. And this is uh, some of the highlights of the uh, summary of our two hours uh, uh, discussions. And uh, to me, uh, it was quite an uh, impressive point to me was just listening different perspective from different cultural background, different uh, the uh, perspective was really, uh, it gave me a thought for thinking. A, uh, it gave me somehow a new insight and uh, new challenges to, to 
that we can cope with the new challenges uh, we are facing. And I suppose many of you still have lots of things to discuss, and I hope you can continue over the lunch. And also, I would like to, once again, I really uh, appreciate all your, uh, all the speakers, audiences, and also United Nations organizations and the Korean ministries who are preparing all these uh, great uh, sessions of this symposium. And I hope you can enjoy lunch. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.